back, Fantasy Fiction Fanatics. It's great to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. Today's class is going to be on another set of Haro the Ninth chapters, and this time it's going to be chapters 22 through 28. And I know I say this at the beginning of every class, it seems like, for this book, um, but this story is not seem to be straightening out. I still feel like we are all over the place, and um, especially compared to last book where even though we had a lot of mystery going on there at least it was like a coherent set of events and this book is just all over the place where you know you're in one the past then you're in the present and then you're kind of jumping around in the present to like different things that are going on and I'm really just hoping since this is uh, my first time reading this book uh, in case you guys forgot that at the end of this book we're just gonna have a moment where the author just aligns it all and it's just gonna be like an all moment where we suddenly have understanding about what all of this is leading us to. Um, but right now we really don't. So I uh, forgive me in advance again if anything, especially with the recap, is a little bit everywhere. Um, and I think I found some interesting things for us to talk about for this section. So hopefully you will enjoy what I got from this uh, set of chapters and what I am presenting you for this discussion. Of course, as always, uh, you're welcome to comment down below if you think I missed anything or if there's anything else that you would like to talk about that I don't get to, that I uh, possibly you think I got wrong, anything at all. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions, so please let me know if you want to discuss anything particular for this set of chapters or this book. Okay, so the recap. Let's go ahead and see if we can piece together what happened in these chapters. First, Haro is awakened in the middle of the night um, by the body in her dream, and she finds Cytheria shambling down, her, her corpse or whatever, is shambling down the hallway towards her, and she ends up locking herself in her room until she's gone. Um, and Ianth does really nothing about it, even though she goes ahead and right afterward and tells her. And then Haru um, is trying to prove herself and is practicing her two-hander. So we have uh, a couple of events going on in there and we end up seeing that she's practicing her two-hander. She's trying to take what people are saying to her about how she should be improving, what she should be doing. Um, and she ends up going by Cytheria's body, um, and, or the room that Cytheria's body is being kept in, and sees the door is closed. So she goes and opens the door, only to find that Ortus is um, sexually involved with the corpse. I mean, not like fully uh, doing anything, but he is. Ex it is clear that he is being explicit with the corpse and is touching her and moving her around. So. Um, that's an interesting moment, for sure. Um, and she ends up talking about to uh, Ianth about it, and they uh, end up talking about several different things while they're together in her room before Haro ends up going to bed for the night. Um, and Haro is still very concerned that Ortis is going to kill her, for real, one, one of these times. So she's very, very... Um, has a lot of anxiety about it. Sorry, I'm like, what was the word I was trying to think of? It never came to me. Um, she has a lot of anxiety about it, and so she takes her bath, uh, if you can nearly call it that, um, and she has all these wards around her and stuff like that, but they end up being all broken, and Ortis comes in while she's taking her bath and tries to kill her. Luckily, she wounds him enough that he ends up running out and does not finish the job. But this leads her to deciding Ortis has to die. And later, she is deciding to learn how to make soup by God's suggestion. And she practices doing soup for several days, several times during the day. She is just continually trying to make the soup. And God asks her to make food for everybody to eat one night as a full group dinner. And she uses some marrow in the soup. So then from that marrow, when everybody has eaten, she makes a construct in Ortis's body from that marrow in order to try and kill him at the table, which she has stopped 
from doing based on God uh, getting in her way and not letting her finish the job. Um, and almost kills him. Doesn't quite kill him, but it's very, very close. She almost finishes her job. And then we jump to the past, where we see a moment where Silas um, ends up throwing Corona Beth off of a cliff, and then cliff diving over, uh, and Haro just assumes that both of them are dead from that fall. Even though she does not get to physically see them through the fog, she is certain that they are lost. And then Haru wakes up sometime later in Ianth's bed. And Ianth is desperately trying to get rid of her fake arm that was given to her. So Haru helps her out and actually regrows her a new arm, though she does make it a skeleton arm versus a flesh and blood arm. And Ianth is very happy about that and decides that she's going to help Haru kill Ortis. And then we jump back to the past yet again where Haru is in the company of Abigail and Magnus, and she ends up telling them that she uh, saw Silas and Corona Beth jumping off the, that cliff, or push, being pushed off the cliff and then jumping off the cliff, and admits to both of them that she is insane and doesn't know reali some reality from uh, just it being her head making it up. Okay, so I know that was kind of a long recap, it's just sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what's going to be important for this recap or not when we're jumping around to all these little tiny moments. So hopefully you think I did a decent job kind of outlining the basics of what goes on and what is the major events for this set of chapters. Um, and then I have three things for us to talk about as usual. Um, and the first one I'd like to talk about is Haru's ability. So I find this book in general to be very interesting because uh, we're continually, with Haru obviously, we're continually knowing about what's going on, how she's using her magic, how she's not using her two-hander, that kind of stuff. But book one gave the impression that Haru is someone who is very, very strong in her necromancy. That she is someone who is a cut above the rest. Um, that not most people could not do what she does. Um, especially with just the little figment of bones that she can make a full skeleton from. That she can do these miraculous things that no one else in their right mind would be able to do. So... Book one gives us this impression is that she is super confident in herself and her necromancy. She's very, very strong. She's not an average necromancer. But here in book two, we are continually seeing kind of a mixture of she is amazing and that she is very, very weak. And I find this to be a very odd combination. It's like, why is it sometimes it seems like she is on top of her game and is acknowledged by other characters, that that is like an incredible thing to have done. And then at other times, like, she is just uh, someone who is not worth training, not worth mentioning, that she is just worthless, um, and that they're not even really sure why she has any merits. So, the way that they say it makes her seem like she's helpless and frail and like not really a good uh, lector and not a good choice to do anything um, is one, she is constantly being attacked by Ortis and most of the time she can't do anything. She is saved by other people because he's just like about to have her murdered by the time she is helped. Even the last time that he um, has tried to murder her in this section when she's in the tub, he completely negates all of her magic comes in, is killing her, and she just manages to end up blind him, and that's why he ends up running out, is because he can't, he has to recover his eyesight in order to be able to attack her anymore. So, I don't totally get, uh, like, how he is just constantly so overpowering her when it seems like she should be able to step up at least a little bit. Though we do understand now that Ortis 
does have the power to cancel out her necromancy because she is a bone necromancer. But still, you would think that she would have a little bit more gusto and not just, you know, be destroyed instantly uh, quite so many times. So in that way, it's making her seem like she is a very helpless, can't do anything kind of uh, necromancer, especially with Gideon being um, her cavalier that, that ended up being inside her uh, to make her a lector. You would think that that portion of Gideon's soul would kind of react and at least be able to do some kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat back to Ortis, even if her memories are of Gideon and things like that have been replaced. At least I'm assuming they've been replaced. Um, so her cavalier skills didn't transfer and that is also making her look helpless and weak because she can't even use her two-hander, she can't use a regular cavalier sword, she doesn't have the strength to barely lift anything. Uh, she's really struggling, even in this time when she mentions that she's practicing with the two-hander, she's just practicing trying to hold it up and to have her arm st strength enough to hold and wield this um, sword, which we do know she could do when she originally first became a, ca a lector and Gideon just first died. Even though it was very heavy for her, she still was able to compensate for that. And then three, because God treats her like she is the weak part of the group. He kind of treats her a little bit, I don't want to say alienated because that's not really totally the case, but he does treat her like, okay, well just, just go practice your two-hander. Oh, don't worry about things like just... Uh, keep yourself busy. Just, you know, don't worry about things. We're going to have a, you set a, you aside for the battle. We don't, we, we know that you're going to die if you even try and fight. Like, he kind of really is coddling her and trying to push her to the side. So all of these elements really are making her look like she is a very weak person. That she has no abilities of her own that she can survive and, um, be a good lector, which is what he wants her to be, is a lector for him to help fight these battles. Then on the other hand, we do see these moments of time where like the power that she has is very acute to the other characters around her. And we see that spark of like, hey, yeah, she is very powerful um, and can do things that not most necromancers can do. For example, the time in the river that she had used that magic, um, used her the energy or whatever when she wasn't supposed to. Um, it wasn't great for her to do that, but she could do it when most people would not, and that is why they didn't even think to tell her not to, is because they didn't expect her to be able to. So we had that moment, and then we also have the moment in this set of chapters where um, just from that little bit of morrow that um, Ortis had ingested in the, from the soup, she was able to make a full construct that ripped through his body and everything like that. So she could do something that nobody in their right mind would expect her to be able to do from such a small little piece of bone or um, bone component, I guess you could say. She was able to completely make a full skeleton, which does make it to... Uh, one of the moments that I thought was the most funny, especially from this section, was where Mercy was like, but she's nine! <laughs> How can she possibly do that? I just thought that was so funny that her age keeps going down from Mercy's point of view. And secondly, that um, God makes that comment like, uh, how is that possible that she could do that? She, You definitely missed the fact that she is exceptional. So. I don't totally understand why we've got this kind of back and forth with her powers and like the way that she is being presented, but we see both sides still there. We see that right now they feel like she is not um, really there. She's not worth it. She seems very low, but then we also have these moments where we see how brilliant she is and that brilliance comes back flaring in something that she does. So. I find it super, super interesting um, that her abilities are being uh, very, you know, back and forth on like exactly how uh, amazing Haru is, especially considering the first book we were like, she was very confident, she was very much on top of her game, she would tell you in an instant that she is amazing um, and that she can do 
extraordinary things and then now that she's a lector it's like her whole personality is not so confident it's very much down in the lowest dregs of where her previous spirit was and even though she can do these wonderful amazing things it still seems like everyone is looking down upon her so um, maybe this is related to her missing memories and the fact that Gideon uh, is no longer present in her past. Maybe it's not, uh, but it will be interesting to see how things progress with her abilities in the future and if they will suddenly come rearing back to where she's at full strength or if right now she is just teetering on uh, the edge of you know being really, really weak but also still having some of her power as well. I just think it's very, very interesting that we don't really have a clear picture of Haru that we had in this first book and don't have a clear picture of exactly how strong she is compared to the others around her. It's one thing if it's like, okay, so all the lectors are like amazingly extra strong and that is why she seems so weak, but she doesn't even have the same kind of confidence, the same kind of feel that she had before. And now she feels like very insecure Orchis has almost killed her several times, and now it just seems like she's very withdrawn and um, curled in on herself because of this ability difference, if that makes sense. So let me know what you think, or if you feel like this is a show, or what exactly you feel is going on with Haro's abilities, and what your thoughts and opinions are. So next I'd like to talk about the tone of this world. So. I just was feeling as I was reading and I was looking over my notes of like the things I talked about that the tone of this actual world and this universe that we are building, um, just the way that the society is and what the concepts are, is just so sad to me right at this moment. Like the way that we are looking at this snapshot of this universe is that this world is very harsh, dark heartless place um, and that is the kind of the tone of this universe of this world is that it is a very harsh dark unforgiving place um, there is a lot of death that is and pain uh, death and pain both that is treated like it is a very casual thing um, like the fact that Haro is in a lot of pain throughout this book so far, and even in this section where she's almost murdered yet again. And it is hardly looked at as anything to focus on. Haro focuses on it when she's in pain, not when she's not in pain. She doesn't ever really comment like, oh my gosh, it's so, it hurts so much to be cut up <laughs> and to be almost murdered. Um, even when we're describing the actual acts, we don't really focus on the fact that the pain is uh, of being hurt is unbearable or anything like that. There is a little bit of that. We do see that Haru mentions that she's in pain and she can't move and stuff like that. But it's almost like it's a sub, a subplot thing versus like a in-your-face thing. Um, it's very much uh, an understated item that the fact that pain seems to mean nothing. Um, we don't even talk about the fact that uh, Ortis, who had a whole skeleton made inside of him, um, no mention of his pain, his problems, nothing like that. And in fact, it's like it never even happened because as a necromancer, you can just put yourself back together and your body back together like it never happened in the first place. Um, so pain is a very casual, understated, not cared about thing. I mean, even Ianth who comes in, or Mercy who comes in and sees her almost dying, doesn't do anything and like doesn't worry about, oh, are you in pain? Are you hurt? Like, I mean, sure, they in some cases they do heal her. Like the first time she was attacked, Mercy came in and healed her, started healing her. But Ianth comes in when she's almost killed in the bathtub and is like, oh, you're dying on the floor? Okay, good. Let me just walk away now. Good luck. Um, and also the part with like where the ant is stabbing her arm over and over again, trying to hack it off. And it's like, shouldn't you be in horrible pain doing this? Like, how can you stand trying to hack your own arm off? Just stabbing again and again and again, and you're not even crying out? Like, it's, it's very crazy to me to think that the 
uh, society has gone to such a point that this necromancy kind of negates pain and experience and all the things that you know normally you have in order to um, your, your body's responding to you being hurt for you being in danger for you having to make sure that you're not overextending yourself so you reel yourself back all these things like don't seem to exist for these people um, it just seems like it's it, the the fact that death could happen is not a thought. I mean, I understand that lectors are much harder to kill, but they can still die, and that is what Ortis is trying to do right now: is to kill Haru, and yet mm, don't really care about the fact that she's almost died several times. Death and pain is just a casual thing that doesn't really matter. It's just something that exists and is thrown away, and not thought about, not cared about. Um, it's very, very casual thing um, in this society, which is kind of heartbreaking that they have come to this point where really it's it's a non-issue. <laughs> um, also, everybody is so disconnected from each other. So disconnected, so don't care about each other. The lectors don't care about each other. God cares about his lectors, but it doesn't really feel like he truly connects to them um a little bit his older ones like mercy and augustine and stuff like that and ortis but even so it's not like he's concerned about what they're doing or their habits he's just like yeah they're just the way they are um he doesn't try to understand haru at all the anth like doesn't give a crap about anybody at least of all haru even though she's supposed to be the one that she's closest to we have seriously so little connection to each other. Everybody just hates each other. Everybody just says, okay, survive on your own. Everybody is so segregated and dispersed and nobody gives a crap about each other. Um, so we see that, that even in the past though, that was the case. Even in book one, we had that, that kind of disconcertedness where like people are very kind of segregated doing their own thing. Of course they did have kind of a competition going between them and that was, uh, partly why they were segregated from each other, but people just dying, they just wanted to figure out who was killing each other because they didn't want to be next <laughs> um, and wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. And so there was a little bit more of a community there, a little bit more closeness. At least I felt like in the end, Haru and Gideon were connected to some of the other people. Uh, but there was even still a little bit of those those moments like where you could see that people were really just not connecting to each other and not caring about each other. And here in this place where the lectors are the only people that these distinct people have to connect to at all, there's only a very small handful that you can connect to and to be involved with. And they are just so disconnected. It's so far from each other, so wanting to be out of each other's way, out of each other's presence, wanting to be very solitary. Um, it's very... Um, heart-wrenching thought to see how little care each of these characters have for each other. Haru seems to be the only person who, you know, in the first book, she seemed to, like, not care. Of course, we recognize that that's not really the case in the end. But Haru's the only person who still cares about anything. She's, like, trying to figure things out. She's trying to say, this is what happened. This is what I saw. This is what's going on. And everyone else is just like, why don't you try and be normal, Haru? Why don't you pick up a hobby? And it's like, what hobby are you expecting her to pick up? <laughs> what are all these other jokers doing? Nothing that I know of. Um, nothing that's like really it would be hobby-ish and normal, I would say, other than that they cook for themselves. Um, so I just feel like Haru is just considered such an outsider and so untrustworthy and so crazy. And Haru feels like for herself that she's crazy. Um, and insane, and it's just so disjointed, and this book, the way it's put together, makes it even more seem um, disjointed and all over the place, and it just seems like a very cruel, harsh world, and the tone of it is just, of this book particularly, is very dark and very unforgiving. Um, and I just wonder what you guys think about that. I haven't read tons of stories that are very deep, dark tone of like even just the place that, that these people are in. Um, and so I find it interesting. 
uh, but it's also very sad to know how far sunk this society is, that the people who I understand have lived a very long life, um, because they are immortal, but those who are supposed to be the highest of this world and have experienced the most of this world have now been like degraded to just little kernels that you know live in their own little society they live in their own little minds without being connected to anybody else or even possibly the ability to connect to anybody else now last but not least i'd like to just touch a little bit on cetheria because i find it very interesting that this character died in the last book but it seems like she's almost a character in this book because of how much she is mentioned, how much her corpse is involved in this story. Um, so it still feels like in many ways that she is an integral part of the plot and part of what's going to be happening. I feel like she is a character because we have a lot of characters who talk about their connection to her. We have several characters who have continually visited her or talked about her um, after they had the funeral or whatever. We have a character who is frisking her <laughs> and her dead body. Um, we have her now shambling down the hallway, possibly being a zombie. So it just seems like we have had her a lot in this book for someone who is dead. Um, so. I feel a little bit like she's a character in this book. I don't know how you guys feel. I don't know if you feel like she is there overwhelmingly in presence, but we have mentioned her so much, um, even though she is dead and um, I don't think they bury people uh, in this uh, society, at least not one. I mean, obviously they're in space, so they don't really have a way to bury her, but they did move her body to this uh, place that they're at and are just keeping her body in this room. So it's very interesting that she is not had any rights or anything like that that's been explicitly told to us that are like for her final resting place. I mean, we don't have any of the other dead lectors in this place that we know of. It's just her. So it really feels like we're being set up for something with her, um, whether Haru really is imagining her being alive or not, uh, that is, is hard to say at this point. But my guess is that probably not, because I don't think that Haru is as nuts as she thinks she is. Though, uh, hopefully we'll find out by the end if that is true or not. Um, and now that we see that Cytheria seems to be coming back to life in some sort of way, um, that is gonna hopefully then present us with her as a character again even more so so i'd really like to understand your thoughts and your feelings on her as a character that's gone and yet still present um, especially the fact that she kind of is having a relationship with ortis post death um obviously i don't think that's probably her choice um, it's interesting that Ortis didn't like her in person, or like, like her when she was alive, but now he is um, attracted to her. We don't totally know if it's because she's a corpse, and that's the only corpse that's around, or if it has something to do specifically with her. That we don't know anything about. Uh, though God seems to think that, that it's highly unlikely that that would be taking place, um, and that Haru might be crazy uh, and missaw whatever is going on. But. Um, to have a whole corpse moved and have Ortis like, you know, touching her and stuff like that. It seems like that's pretty clear um, and it's hard to kind of hallucinate that, I think. Um, but yeah, I definitely feel like Cytheria is making herself known in this book. She's presenting herself as something that's going to still come back and is still haunting Haru somehow. Um, and the question is, will she truly come back from the grave and try and kill Haru and will this be something that everybody else will see? When will be the moment that everyone understands that Cytheria and her corpse is not 100% as they think she is? 
Um, and what is driving her to be risen from the grave? Is somebody animating her? Maybe this is also something that has to do with Ortis and the fact that he's touching her, as well as the fact that he wants to kill Haru. Um, so maybe he is somehow able to animate her body and making it so that way Haru thinks that Cytheria is coming back from the grave to kill her. But um, a lot of people seem to have mixed feelings about her, uh, but everyone seem to have come to the funeral that they had for her and that they really truly appreciated her when they, she was alive and that they liked her a lot more than they usually like each other. So in general, I just feel like Cytheria is mentioned a lot and in many ways you learn more about her and her relationships now that she's dead. Um, and so it kind of feels like she is also being presented as a character who could have something going on in the future of this book. And I just really like to hear your thoughts and feelings about her, especially since um, she is something, she is kind of there, kind of not, but is um, an interesting, in an interesting position. She's not in a normal position of being a sub character, being a background character, being just somebody that was thrown in there for a specific reason and then that's all you see of them. She is someone who was killed in the first book and we learned a lot about her actions from the first book and then now we see her in a new perspective from other characters and even though she's dead she still is a prominent presence in this story so let me know your thoughts and feelings on that and then let's go ahead and move on to the nitty-gritty so um, i have a couple things that I think are worth mentioning or things that I found interesting. And I had an idea. Um, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Um, and I don't know how you think about this. So go ahead and let me know again what your thoughts are. But I kind of wonder if Haru is the haunted feeling, or sorry, that Gideon is the haunted feeling that Haru is having. Um, especially when she thinks about those past events, she always feels like there's a little bit something wrong, that she's a little bit haunted feeling, something like that. I wonder if that is all the presence uh, subconsciously that Haru knows that something's missing and that's Gideon. Um, also, I feel like maybe the insane portion of Haru or what she feels that she is insane is actually Gideon trying to make an impression on Haru subconsciously like all those notes that that she reads that the other person says oh that's not at all what it says it makes me wonder if those are notes left by Gideon for Haru maybe he's trying to wake her up um, or come through those memories or whatever has happened to Haru um, but I do think that maybe Gideon is haunting her in some way uh, subconsciously in the past sections so love to hear your thoughts on that but that's just an impression that I'm getting is that maybe she is being haunted by Gideon um, the second thing is I find it's interesting that nobody trusts Haru's word so Haru is saying all these things <laughs> and is trying to explain to people what is going on in these experiences that she's having and it's like nobody trusts her on anything nobody trusts her about Ortis Nobody trusted her about Cytheria's body being moved around. Nobody cares about anything Haru says about anybody, anything about Ianth, anything about Mercy, anything about Augustine, anything that she has experienced, anything that she has wondering about, anything about anything. It's like Haru is being swept under the rug. Like, don't think about it, don't think about it, don't worry about anything. Um, and I just don't understand where this distrust comes, especially from God, who was so adamant about Haru being a lector for him and is so adamant about Ortis not killing her even though apparently she has no way of surviving anyway. Um, but all this stuff is like nobody trusts her for anything and I don't understand why they feel like she is so untrustworthy especially God who's like everything she's like says he's like well I'm not really sure if you saw that like Maybe you're just feeling a trick on you because I really don't feel like that's that kind of person's character. And it's like, why don't you actually try and take a leap of faith or something and at least question the situation or question the other person instead of just being like, no, I think you're just misinterpreting or I think you just missaw or hey, I really don't think that, that it happened. Like, come on, there's so many of them. 
so many. And Hara is a very observant person and she doesn't have any thing else to do with her time as everyone else has mentioned she has no hobbies she has no normal tendencies for like cooking or other things that would be considered normal like reading or anything so maybe after so many things of her telling you this maybe believe her for once i don't know i just think it's very interesting that nobody trusts her and nobody has interest and is the only person that has believed her on anything and most of the time she just doesn't care. <laughs> so um, I feel bad that Haru is like in this position where she feels so, I feel like she's very disconnected to herself. And nobody, nobody even thinks to listen to what she's saying and to have any faith in it. So it's very, very sad and very interesting because I don't understand why this is in place. Um, the next thing is we have had the body, capital B, body, talking a little bit more recently. We have the body that, you know, during the dream woke her up because Cytheria was coming for her. And when she says that Ortis must die, the body agrees. So there is some development with that at least, that we are seeing it be more interactive. It's not just a presence there. Um, and usually the body only shows up now when something is uh, the body is actually doing something or interacting. It's not just haunting her or in the room or, you know, back at the beginning when God and the body were like, like right close to each other or whatever. So it's not like it just shows up all the time right now. It's really only shows up when it is saying something or when it's doing something particular. So we do have some development for the body, which I think is very interesting, even though we don't know what that development is or why at this point point. and last but not least i also found it interesting that haru does end up giving Ianth that arm that she didn't want to give her before that she was very adamant about not uh, helping her with uh, but she seems to have taken pity on her and helps her uh, though she makes it a skeleton arm she doesn't make it a regular human arm um and Partly I think that's because Haro is uh, mostly a bone necromancer, that's what she specializes in. But also I think because Haru, though she thinks, though she knows the Anth would not be the same as her, like she would care more about that, but Haru doesn't care about that kind of stuff, and so would not care to spend the extra effort for Ianth for that. But it seems like Ianth is very satisfied with what she has is just to have the skeleton portion of her arm but it still be her actual arm is enough for her so i thought it was very interesting that she finally broke down and decided to take pity of her on her and give her the arm that she wanted um i guess we will see how that changes things moving forward okay i guess that wraps us up for um chapters 22 through 28 for haro the ninth Again, please let me know what your thoughts and feelings are. I would really love to have a discussion with you on this book, especially since this book is a little bit more of a book that you have to focus on and read and really try and think between the lines in order to understand what's going on and to get the full effect of the book. So a discussion is always appreciated to uh, help me and hopefully to help you uh, understand it and enjoy it better. Uh, let's go over the trivia before we go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who participated in this past week's trivia. I always love seeing your answers and I really appreciate getting to play with you. So thank you for playing with me. I always have a fun time with it. Um, last week's answer was sylphs, uh, which are spirits of the air. So um, congratulations to the three people who got it right. We had Paul. Brendan and Christian should stop eating pixie sticks for breakfast, which I agree you probably should stop eating pixie sticks for breakfast. That seems like not the healthiest way to start the day, but to each their own. Um, congratulations you three for getting it right. Thank you so much to those of you who sent in answers, even if you didn't get it correct. I really appreciate you playing with me and I hope you will continue to do so. 
If you would like to join in with the trivia question, um, go ahead over to the blog, fantasyfictionfanatics.net. Um, you can go ahead on the right hand side and scroll down just a little bit. This question will be right there, at least for the desktop version. If you are on mobile, you will have to scroll almost all the way down to the end of the page in order to see the question, but you will be able to answer it there. Um, while you're over there, if you would like more content from me, um, you are welcome to look at all the blog posts I have over there. Um, I've got lots of different topics over there, different discussions of my thoughts on fantasy or reading or different things like that. If you're a writer, I have some, some writing stuff on there. I've got um, different recommendations for books and films and lots of different fantasy related stuff. I've got a little a couple of things that are more um, personal related and lots of different stuff. So go ahead if you want more content from me than what's just on this channel, you are welcome to check it out over there and hopefully you will find something you enjoy. Also you can sign up for my newsletter. I will email about once a month with updates about fantasy fiction fanatics, updates with me, and some behind the scenes of fantasy fiction fanatics that you don't get anywhere else. So. Hopefully you will join us there as well. Okay, if you would like to have that conversation with me or have a discussion or just say anything you would like about uh, the books or anything, you can go ahead and comment down below. Uh, I'd be happy to hear from you. If that is not the best place for you, go ahead and head over to Facebook. I have a Facebook page, which is slash fantasy fiction one. You are welcome to reach me over there as well as get updates from me on there as well as Twitter, which is also at fantasy fiction one. You can get updates from me there or contact me however you would like. Um, so those two are great places. Also, I do have an email, which is always listed in the description. If you would like to email me and discuss things with me through there. Though, if you would like to discuss things with me and your fellow fantasy fanatics, uh, we would be happy to have you join the Discord. The link for that will be down below, so you are welcome to click that link and join and have a conversation with me, as well as your fellow fantasy fanatics who are, we have several people already over there chatting and talking about all things fantasy, book related, uh, as well as just fun related um, other topics, just things that we can enjoy discussing together and learning together. So I would be happy to see you on there and hopefully you are, would be willing to join us. But I think that is it from me today. So I guess I will see you guys in the next class. Um, I don't think I will be getting any up next weekend since it is Christmas weekend and I will be out of town. So I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas to everybody who celebrates and I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.